So welcome everybody to the last uh, SUNY Faculty Development Community of Practice meeting. I'm Chris Price. I'm the Academic Programs Manager at the Center for Professional Development, joining you from Rochester. Uh, and um, so a couple of things I wanted to just say uh, at the outset today. Uh, these were the, this was the first year we've had meetings like this. So, um, you know, it was kind of an experiment uh, that we put in place you know, because we typically would have met probably in person at some point this year uh, and um, in the fall, uh, we would have, uh, we have usually, we've tried to have a full statewide meeting, faculty developers meeting, which we had back in the fall of 2020. Uh, and then the fall of 21, we would have had uh, some kind of regional meetings uh, and uh, we decided not to do that and do this instead. Um, and so in talking to the advisory board for the faculty development community of practice, um, you know, they, they suggested doing these regular meetings. So I think, you know, we will continue doing these uh, next year just to provide an opportunity to give you all to provide updates on what you're doing and to learn from others on, on the campuses. And, and I think the schedule of doing them every couple of weeks throughout the semester seemed to work. Um, if you have thoughts about, um, I might send out a survey about them. I haven't decided yet. I, I get so many surveys, uh, and, I'll, and and I and I think I've got the sense that they were working pretty well. Um, so in lieu of a survey, I'm just gonna you know put my email in the chat. I'm sure you all know at this point. Um, if you'd like to either present or you have ideas about this series of events, you know shoot me an email, uh, and I'll probably meet with the faculty development community practice advisory board sometime over the summer. Uh, and we'll plan the activities for the year and, 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 you know, I'll bring up anything that you have to say to me, to them. And, you know, uh, we will, um, we don't have plans necessarily yet to have anything face to face. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the pandemic's still around uh, and also travel budgets are an issue, I think, for, for many. So, uh, you know, hopefully that stuff will start to ease up next academic year. Uh, CIT, however, is still uh, going on. I know there's a online piece, but there's also still a face-to-face -face piece. And we actually will have, I'm gonna put the link to uh, the CIT website in the chat. We're going to have, if you're gonna be at CIT, uh, maybe if you could just show a hands uh, in the, use the app or yeah, either like that, or uh, how many of you are planning on going? Uh, Jamie's going, uh, Laurie's going, great, Lisa, sweet. Uh, so on, um, June 2nd, so that's Thursday of CIT, from 3.30 to 4.30, so I'll put it in the chat, June 2nd, 3.30 to 4.45 actually, 4.45, we will have a faculty development community of practice uh, special interest group meeting. So uh, we'll have the opportunity to meet uh, for those of you who are coming to CIT and us, we go face to face at that time. Uh, and, you know, that meeting will really just be a open, uh, let's talk about how things are going, get to, sh again, sh like we've been doing in these meetings, but, you know, we'll have the opportunity to do it face-to-face -face for the first time in over two years. So really looking forward to that and looking forward to CIT. It's, it'll be really my first time, uh, actually the first travel I've done in over two years with the couple of going out to the office in Syracuse a couple of times. But Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know, it's unbelievable. I mean, I went from traveling, you know, two or three times a month to right. nothing. <laughs> so. Me too. I was traveling once a month and I did go to Educause. That was strange. I wonder, okay. what are you hearing about the registration for CIT? Is it going to be uh, lower? It's a little lower than normal, uh, you know. Um, but, you know, part of that could be, so the IITG program uh, had a requirement in the past that those who received IITG grants uh, were required to present at CIT every year. So since ITG was put on pause, uh, you know, in the fall of 20, so there weren't, so anybody that obviously, last folks to get grants for IITG were, were there's the 1920 year. And those folks obviously didn't present at CIT the following year because, right. um, you know, that one, well, that one we had virtually, but we didn't, they were supposed to be presented the one in the fall, in the spring of 20, right? The right. 1920 folks. So we didn't, we haven't had anybody doing IITG since then. So that's, you know, a significant proportion of people um, that would typically attend the conference. 
Uh, last I heard, you know, registration was a little low, but um, with the number of people that were accepted to present, that <laughs> essentially will, will cover, you know, what we need right. to cover for the conference. So, you know, I think it'll be lower than a typical CIT, but, um, you know, I, I think we'll have, we'll have a good amount of folks there and, mm -hmm. and people are really just, you know, trying, you know, want to get out and, and see people in person. So uh, right. let's hope that the numbers down here go down a little more. I mean, they've kind of spiked right lately. Uh, so hopefully by the end of May, early June, they'll, they'll go down a bit. Chris, I'm sure it's there, but I wanted to ask you. Um, so when I'm going to present with Jay, and we did it, she she selected the online one. I just didn't know if you paid for that. If you if, if you paid for a day, could you do the online one too? I just I couldn't really find it. I might have just not looked well enough on the uh, site to see about the cover and the cost of if you're presenting online versus going. If you're presenting online, yeah, yeah that's obviously a separate registration than um, you know okay. face to face, and so um, if you register for online you just you have access to obviously all the online pieces but not everything is going to be online right and so yeah, I, kind of I wish she had done it i didn't know she's putting it in i would like to because i have been been yeah. somewhere but she put in for online so i probably couldn't justify more than one cost you know yeah i mean if you well if you want to register for face to face you could still participate online and come the other days i mean that's the other option that folks have i, right? I just so, didn't know it was a double cost so i will look at you know, for that yeah no if you want to transition your registration from the online to face to face and still oh. participate in the online panel yeah we could do that okay good because i would want to ask for more than than i could all right thank yeah, you yeah so yeah if you want to transition i see James one day yeah, one day would be like you said. Sometimes you just you get so much. I've spent spent so long. Like you said, you get so much, and it's hard to be online all day. It, it is. Uh, it is. I know. I just saw. Email. I just saw someone say something because I I'm actually supposed to travel in June for a meeting uh, on a on the pod uh, core committee, which I serve on, and um, we're actually going to be meeting in person in June. And you know, a couple folks are saying you know they'd rather you know they made a decision that that's not uh, they don't they don't want to attend for you know, personal reasons and, um, yeah. and we're trying to figure out ways to like, you know, bring them in. And someone said that they attended a session recently or heard from somebody recently that said that, you know, part of the issue with Zoom versus face-to-face -face is the fact that you're looking at people up close. Yeah. Especially a long yeah. period of time and that you could have this sense of feeling threatened, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. looking at people's faces for hours on end up front and, um, and that maybe there are ways to kind of mitigate that by, I don't know, moving screens back or I don't know. She didn't say, but it was uh, funny because when we had the we had the polycom, remember, and you only saw the large classroom. Remember the the first courses we did like that with the polycom. All you saw was everybody. So it's it's a strange strange thought. Either really long or really close. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully people are doing you know dissertations and research on all this, uh, and we're going to learn oh, a yeah, lot about a lot. Uh, a lot. the effect of uh, meeting people uh, online like this. So anyway, so I hope those of you are coming to CIT. I hope you know, Jamie. I hope. You guys get that covered at uh, uh by UUP to attend. Um, you know, I know I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, unfortunately, I live in Rochester, so I won't be staying over, which is always nice to stay over and see people for you know drinks or whatever after. We we'll, won't necessarily be doing that, but um, just being there face to face will, will be nice. Uh, the other thing I wanted to update you all on is that uh, you know, we have made the transition to Yammer. Uh, from workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that transition has not gone as smooth as we would have liked. Uh, right now, we're kind of in a, in a situation where unlike workplace, where it was kind of a shared space with system and the campuses, um, Yammer is now, uh, it's basically uh, uh, the system administration instance of Yammer, and everybody on the campuses is being invited, essentially as guests into the system groups that are, we're setting up. Uh, that's not how we like to do it. Uh, and we're actually working with Microsoft on a proof of concept to do something that's more of a shared space. Uh, but Microsoft has to develop that. Frankly, they haven't done that yet. So it's going to take some time. Uh, but we'll hopefully get to a place where we had kind of like what we have with Workplace, but in the Yammer space. But it's going to take some time. I'm hopeful that you know by the fall we'll have something set up. But I just put in the chat the link to the trainings around Yammer. Um, and if you're having any issues with Yammer, my colleague, Chris Lynch, is the one, um, I'll put her email in the chat, so it's chrislynch at suny.edu. So if you're having issues getting in to some of the groups, um, Chris can assist with that. We're working with the help desk at System and the help desks on the campuses to resolve those issues. And I know um, folks at UB were having 
you know, really working, we were working with them and I think we've gotten all of those folks in now. Uh, and so we know we can resolve them, but it might take some time. Uh, Keith, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about Yammer, Chris, because, you know, we have University Faculty Senate. We have all the senators, we have the CGLs, we have um, lists that are run through SUNY's ancient uh, listserv uh, application for every single sector group, for every committee and so forth. I was thinking of you know, whether or not Yammer could help modernize some of that, but we really want to have a whole institution space for university faculty senate and be able to have you know all of these various group spaces under sort of underneath mm -hmm. where there could be communications and file sharing and so forth is yammer going to be up to the up to that or or should we not invest a lot of, so of i guess money? what i'd say keith is uh um so i just like put the link in the in there into the the chat of the, the training that's scheduled. I, I only know, I've, I've been using it a little bit, right? So I've been mostly using the desktop version of it. And right now, you know, what it seems to me is it's a very kind of, you know, it's a group based, obviously. It's, it, it looks a lot like team, uh, well, not teams, for uh, workplace, frankly. Uh, I, and, uh, and in terms of having subgroups, I don't see any kind of that functionality where you have one large group and subgroups kind of almost like, um, uh, you know, there are other tools out there I'm sure you're familiar with that do that kind of thing, um, like Slack, right? I mean, it sounds like what you're looking for is something similar to Slack or, or uh, Basecamp or something like that. Maybe oh, that's a little more team uh, project management stuff, but, uh, but I don't know. I'm not the person to actually answer that question. <laughs> I think the folks from Microsoft are going to be doing those trainings that we have set up. Uh, and so I would say, and they're coming up next month. So if you could attend one of those, you know, and then you could ask the Microsoft person those questions and then figure it out. Um, if you want something sooner than that, uh, you know, I'm sure Chris could get you in touch with somebody from Microsoft to have that conversation. And then, you know, we'll figure it out. Like we are, like I said, planning on something that will do exactly what you're saying, I think, in the fall, hopefully. And that way you could create groups. Right now, all the group creation has to happen at system. So Chris yeah, okay. Lynch has been trying to set those groups up and she has to basically be the person to add folks to the group. So it's really that kind of, if you all remember when we had, we used WordPress for the learning commons for prior to workplace, it's essentially what we reverted to. Although I do think the Yammer space is a lot preferable to the, the way uh, WordPress used to be with in terms of like folks contributing posts and things like that. But um, yeah, it's not what, how we like it. We'd like to have it as a shared space and that's hopefully what we're going to get. So we have our summer planning meeting in June where we'll have the executive committee, we'll have the committee chairs, we'll have the sector reps and so forth uh, in for a couple of days. I'm wondering if some, if by that point it would be worthwhile having someone have a conversation with UFS. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't want to volunteer Chris for that. Right. <laughs> So the other thing that we had, I think I might have mentioned this at our last meeting, is that Kelly Williamson, who was our community programs manager, who was kind of, she was hired around the same time that Workplace started, and her right. primary task was to <coughs> Workplace. So Kelly left SUNY, and this was just coincidence. She got offered another job outside of SUNY, yeah. and she left on April 1st, right up when Workplace left. So, so Chris has kind of been stepping up, and actually Chris has a background in working uh, with Microsoft, so she has familiar out with that, but I, you know, again, I don't want to volunteer her to right. do that, but you could certainly reach out to her and um, feel free to copy me in and then uh, we could figure something out, right? Um, maybe Lisa Raposo might be the person that, that actually attends that meeting um, rather than Chris. So okay. reach out to, if you want Keith, just reach out to me and Chris and Lisa and we could figure something out. Okay, thanks. All right. Hi, Keith. Well, I got you. I mean, I know that, you know, you're on the board of trustees and the search for the uh, new chancellor is happening. I don't know. Is there anything you can update us on, on that? I mean, um, probably not at this point. I mean, the only thing that, that I can update you on is what's already public information. The, the members of the search committee have been posted. You were working with uh, Isaacson um, Miller 
Uh, the position description has been posted. Uh, I just got an invitation to join some private space where we will be eventually sharing candidate materials. We, we, um, I will say it's certainly been a much different process than the anointment of the last uh, chancellor, um, who was basically just uh, the former governor's uh, uh, man in Moscow kind of thing. Um, so we've had meetings of four different constituent groups who kind of define what uh, the different stakeholders are looking for in the new chancellor that went into the um, position description and Isaacs and Miller are starting to you know work their networks to develop a candidate pool. I mean, if you've got any any um, candidates, there's uh, uh, I don't have the email off the top of my head, but obviously they're I mean, they're just looking for for names. There'll be obviously some people who who apply in response to the public posting of the position, but that's generally not the way that the serious candidates for these kinds of positions eventually get um, into the pool. What's the timeline? Uh, well, the idea is still to have a chancellor or new chancellor on board by the fall. Okay. So it's fairly aggressive. Uh, I, you know, very, we're all very appreciative of Deborah for stepping up to be in-room chancellor, but she does not want this to be an 18 month position. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, she wants to get all back to her retirement. So the more aggressive we can be, the better. Thanks. Yeah, uh, there was an article in the Chronicle last week about how difficult it is to be a chancellor or president of a system like yep. SUNY. And um, yeah, so and Nancy Zimfer was you know, heavily quoted in that uh, that piece. I think she's been doing some thinking around that. So anyway, well, good luck. I hope it, you know, we're keeping our fingers crossed <laughs> that we have a good outcome. Yep. Um, so if you just joined us, uh, Jamie uh, Perrin, who are, uh, who's going to be giving the update on the Brightspace training plan. We'll be here at, and hopefully by 1030. She's currently conducting a, a training uh, uh, right now. So um, she, Jamie will be here at 1030 to give that update. And uh, we're just spending the, the first half hour to um, uh, just, I don't know, just I, I gave my updates. I think that's about all I wanted to say. Uh, I was just curious to see uh, if you all had other things that you wanted to share uh, or questions that you have. Um, Anything exciting going on that you've got planned for the summer or for the fall next year or anything that you did, I don't know, the past year that that was new that you're especially proud of or that you th thought went really well, I'd, I would love to hear it. Well, I, I, I don't know, I think I might have mentioned this before, but you know, with, with me being essentially on leave to SUNY this year and next for the UFS president position, I've used some of the money that came to campus from SUNY to make up for that to provide faculty stipends for going through Cornell's um, teaching and learning in the diverse classroom MOOC. Cool, that's great. Yeah, yeah uh, I think I think you had mentioned that, Keith. And um, have you got any feedback from folks about about that yet, or is it uh, not not be formally? Well, actually, I, I debriefed the three facilitators. They they were all very happy with their cohorts. Um, I'm behind on getting the paperwork. You know, we've got thirty plus uh, PAF forms to get processed and up through the approval chain to get these small stipends out, which is always a, a nuisance. But uh, no, I, I think the the faculty who were uh, involved were uh, were um, happy with uh, the ability to, be, to go through the MOOC with other faculty. Yeah, and we did that um, at Rockport too. We did that the faculty of uh, faculty community faculty of uh, color and um, uh, international faculty. It was really good. We went through that certification. It was a really good. <coughs> Yeah, there's a lot of you know, great programs out there. The other I wanted to share with you all, I don't know, I probably did, I've shared this with you all before, but uh, you all know that we've had these Lumen Circle opportunities. I know I've talked about them in this space for a while and Lumen added a belonging circle that's sort of related to diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice. 
and uh, they just um, also released a self-paced course for faculty, but pretty much anybody on a campus, and it's free to anybody at SUNY. And so the information about that is in the link I just posted to the chat. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, feel free to share that with faculty and staff. Uh, that course is available through July 31st. So, you know, they can sign up now and, um, you know, all the details are on there. I won't take up time explaining them, but um, I've gone through it. It's, it's in Canvas. Uh, they have a Canvas instance that they put it in uh, and uh, it's pretty good. It's not, it's self-paced, but there's coaching. Uh, there are facilitators. And so, um, yeah, check it out. Beth, did you just have your hand up? Yeah, if I may, yeah. I, I wanted to say that I had also gone through the Lumen Belonging training and a couple of their other self, um, uh, their their fellowship circles, and they really are uh, fantastic. And for for this particular situation where we're trying to get more faculty engaged in um, the DEI training, I think it's a it, it's such an easy way for faculty to make that connection. Um, so I would. I, I'm, I'm recommending it constantly on on my campus and I would I would highly recommend it too. Yeah, I was actually yesterday uh, at a meeting of people on the campuses the, who do program review academic program review and presenting on our diversity equity inclusion and teaching and learning certificate program, uh, which you know we offer at the CPD and have for the last three years, and uh, one of the folks who had the meeting was saying. Uh, there's just so much they were a little overwhelmed by the options and so uh you know and they said well, it would just be great if we just had one program that everybody would take and i was sympathetic to that but i said you know and you all know this probably from doing your work you know that like a one size fits all option is just not going to work with your faculty i mean the program that we offer our certificate program i mean there are three courses uh they're six weeks each um uh you heard i think it was lisa uh mentioned earlier that she's in the middle of one and it's a lot of work <laughs> that takes and we say three to five hours per week sometimes folks take more than that and and it's just not an option for everybody and we we, we recognize that and so you know we really need uh, a variety of tools i think at our disposal to assist campuses so it's on us though to uh, me specifically to you know make sure that we help guide campuses and individuals to the the, the training, the workshop, the professional development program that's going to work best for them. So if any of you are, you know, a little overwhelmed by the choices or the options that are out there, feel free to reach out to me and I can assist and hopefully get you in the right direction. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I see Jamie's here. Hey, Jamie. Anybody else have anything that they want to share or questions, Lori? No, I was just going to say, Jamie, don't you want to go take a little break or walk around the office? You're like, <laughs> you, uh, every time I walk by one of my staff, you're up on their screen. I'm uh, really, you're a superstar. Yeah, yeah. I literally just finished the scaled <laughs> webinar uh, one minute ago, <laughs> popped right in here. And then I have another training that starts at noon. So amazing. I remember those days when we moved to a new LMS, I just... I felt like I spent all of my time in training. So yeah. kudos to you. I do like hearing your voice everywhere, but seriously, their, their offices are all right next to mine. And I'm like, oh, that's oh, funny. There's a training. <laughs> that's funny. All right. So if anybody, if you know, all don't have anything else, I'm just going to you know, turn over to Jamie. And uh, I know I, I was at the ATIS meeting the other day, it's Jamie. So I'm guessing that this slideshow is going to look a little familiar, the slide deck. Yeah. In fact, okay. I just changed the date. <laughs> Great. That was can perfect. I, that was going to tell you that one that you presented on the other day was perfect. And so, oh, good. Uh, if you want to give me sharing uh, oh, yeah, sorry. privileges, I can pop right in. Okay. So I'm going to give you a presentation and give you information that I can literally say in my sleep. So I apologize. I will try to keep my pace slow. I really blew through this on, on Monday when I talked about this with the ATIS group, but um, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the training plan to all of you, just so if you get questions from your campus members, et cetera, or you can maybe help us promote it a little bit, uh, that will be really helpful. So 
we have uh, developed what I think is a fairly uh, comprehensive training plan for our campus faculty and staff that provides a significant uh, amount of choice and flexibility for our, our campuses. And you'll notice that I have a fire theme throughout here, and that's because Brightspace has a fire um, in the middle of their Brightspace A. And so I've, I've taken that theme and run with it. And so I want to talk a little bit about the comprehensive training. We wanted to take this opportunity because it's uh, the one time in 10 years where we're going to have access to about 45,000 uh, faculty members and expand just beyond the point and click uh, technology aspects of the learning management system and talk about some critically important things like online pedagogy, where we talk about just some, some things that people should keep in mind as they are delivering uh, course materials, not just online, but face-to-face -face as well. We talk about some accessibility requirements. We highlight some of the different disabilities that our students uh, come into the classroom with and how we can assist those students with certain design strategies, with certain accommodations, et cetera, to make their learning experience better. And then we present some information that was developed by uh, Chris Romlick from uh, SUNY, on, SUNY Onondaga, uh, Onondaga Community College rather, um, about uh, universal design for learning. And ultimately what we give people in each of these first three segments is, you know, three to five takeaways. So we know now why online pedagogy is important, why accessibility and UDL are important. It can be overwhelming, but just start with these few little things and some of them actually overlap and you're going to A, get fewer questions from your students, you're going to B, see better retention and better uh, kind of uh, responsiveness to the, the assignments that you, you have your students to uh, demonstrate their learning, et cetera. And so I think that we're finding some success with that. We've got some initial pushback from faculty and instructional designers saying, why are you forcing us to learn this stuff? But they've seen that we've made it really accessible, really brief. It's not we don't talk down to people. It's really just a way to say, do these little things and, and everything's going to be great. So then we dive into the definite point and click where we talk about the user interface, communication tools, and any and all of these uh, tools within Brightspace that they need initially to be successful in Brightspace. There are, of course, way more tools than what we can uh, accommodate in this uh, initial training. So we are we have plans then to follow up with advanced trainings to talk about those tools that once you're in there in the system, it will make more sense to learn them and will also make teaching much more effective and efficient. And we of course focus on migration strategies. Um, unfortunately for all of my attendees, they definitely definitely get a blackboard bias uh, because I while I've taught in Moodle, I have not taught in Moodle, and uh, I'm not as familiar with it as I am with Blackboard. Hey, I'm so, going to interrupt you too, Jamie. Sure. One, one thing to remember that I'm seeing in a, in a lot of these trainings is we we do have a campus that's using Canvas, mm -hmm. um, and, and um, that's something that I really have been struggling, and I actually contacted Brightspace directly to work with them on because um, my faculty are really panicking Okay. Um, because from a SUNY perspective, they hear a lot of Blackboard and Moodle, but we're still here. I mean, I yeah. know we're a small minority, but um, it's going to be a big, big change for us too. So Lori, I would love to uh, talk with you offline about this. We are running in May uh, fireside chats on Moodle and Blackboard migration strategies. So if you wanted to do a session on Canvas migration strategies, I know that that would be well received as well. Okay. And the Blackboard and Moodle ones are just going to talk about. So this is what you can do in your uh, current learning environment to clean up your course prior to transfer. And this is right. what you're going to experience post migration and, and just give them some, some heads up about what to expect. Yeah, I, I mean, again, one, that's not something I can speak to directly because I've I know. actually never been in Canvas. The one thing that really sucks about Canvas, I'm just going to be brutally honest, is that our export package is a pretty generic package and mm. it does not import properly into Brightspace, okay. namely in the gradebook area because oh. there is no gradebook in Canvas. 
So what we're recommending anyway with the grade book is that you don't copy it in. Right. <laughs> uh, so, and that's for any uh, learning management system. So it's not a huge loss. Okay, it's good. so easy to set up and we're having a uh, faculty touch every single item or gradable activity in their course anyway. Right. Okay. So you have to link it. So that's, that's not a significant loss for you. Yeah. I have, um, I, I, quite honestly, I made a decision that I, I'm so involved in the implementation and all of the working groups that I've decided that I'm not going to do training yet. We're not till phase three. Okay. But one thing that I did create that is public and you can see, Jamie, I put it in the chat is I've been working on a canvas to Brightspace glossary. It's really been one of our focuses um, oh, because okay. vocabulary is very important to me. Um, and and only... we have a document in the training resources group on this as well. So we might want to connect those two. Yeah, let's do it. I mean, okay. I know you can find me and I'm happy to work with you when you have okay. some time. Great. Um, we're not till cohort three, okay. um, but I do want to make sure it goes smoothly. And I'm, you know, I, I get it. You're dealing with a, a whole bunch of um, Blackboard, like many, many, many more Blackboard people, but um, I, I want to go to Brightspace and I want our faculty to feel comfortable with it. So I'm trying to give them some white glove love that it's, you know, that, that they can do it. You sure. know, so. Yeah. Let's, let's communicate on that because uh, I asked a Moodle campus to send me a Moodle file so I could see what that looks like. And then maybe sure. you can send me a Brightspace one and I can see what, or uh, canvas one. Canvas one. Yeah. I'd be happy to, I um, teach a one credit course that I imported that looks pretty good, but quite honestly, um, you've, all probably heard me say before that my philosophy when you move to a new LMS is that you rebuild your courses. <laughs> I mean, that's easy for me. I only have two courses to rebuild and I know many faculty have many, many more. Um, but we're just, we're trying to make sure we know what is best. Um, and, and we can talk on, offline. Okay, so. great. Thanks, Let's Jamie. do that. Thanks, Lori. Okay, so here is the worst slide I have ever demonstrated to anybody or shown anybody. It was so busy, but I really wanted to give the uh, the kind of idea of what the scope is of our training. We have two different overall tracks. You can get a certificate from the Center for Professional Development, or you don't have to get a certificate. The, whether or not a certificate is required is uh, campus-based. And this certificate, uh, the learning objectives were vetted by the training resources group. And so if a campus does require certification, they can review these asynchronous modules and see if it does uh, meet those. And the reason why I say review the asynchronous modules is because regardless of which modality faculty choose to get trained in, the synchronous or the scaled webinars, to get a certificate, they still have to go into the asynchronous modules and take the quizzes. And the quizzes aren't, you know, they're not onerous. They're just five to seven questions based on uh, that topic. But it does, uh, each question is tied to a learning objective. You know, we tried to do best practices there. Everything is mapped out in that way. Um, the asynchronous just launched a couple of weeks ago. That is being controlled. Access to asynchronous is controlled by whether or not an account has been created in Brightspace for a particular user. And when campuses have worked with SUNY to create those accounts, then uh, SUNY is running an enrollment file within those asynchronous modules. And then the campus reaches out to the faculty members or staff members, lets them know their username and password, and then they have access that way. We have, a, I'll talk to you about this that in a little bit, but um, the synchronous remote, these are eight hour sessions, either two days of four hours or four days of two hours where it is a point and click. We work with the faculty members to keep them, uh, keep them on the same page with us as we work through the materials. And then the scaled webinars are an hour of me talking at people and then addressing questions for a half an hour. And I think that they have been fairly successful if I do say my, so myself. And we've been seeing you know, 150, 270 people in these sessions at a time, which is uh, a great way to maximize our time with uh, faculty members, maximize my time, et cetera. Because these synchronous sessions are limited to about 10 to 15 people. Although we have upped it to 20 people for May because the demand is just so high. So we have the same options here for non-certificate as well. Uh, they just don't have to take the quizzes. And what I referenced earlier was this uh, uh, like access to faculty choice. Um, 
so for a faculty member who says, listen, I can just teach myself, give me the training materials and I'm going to go through it myself. They can do the asynchronous modules, no problem. The, uh, the faculty members who, this is actually my preference for learning technology. I want to see it. Show me what to do. I'll go and I'll play after that. And that's where the uh, scaled webinars have come in. And we offer uh, you know, five to 10 per week, where it's about 10 per week right now in May. And uh, we're varying times where, so uh, if you're only available Friday afternoon, by the end of the month, you should have access to all the webinars. We're trying to really um, make it so faculty have uh, some flexibility in that scheduling. And if somebody needs someone to walk them through slowly, they can choose that synchronous online. And we have various uh, speeds for that, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. The, flex, the scaled webinars, they cover every single topic except for online pedagogy because it was so brief. Um, so it covers every single topic in the asynchronous modules. It will only take them about 15 minutes to read through the materials in the online pedagogy. So we figured that's, that's uh, a better use of their time, but uh, we are seeing those larger audience in those scaled webinars. We can see registrations. This was as of Monday. So uh, right now we're at about a uh, thousand for all of them. Gradable activities, I realized uh, three weeks after we had done the scheduling that I never offered, I, that I hadn't offered any scaled webinars for gradable activities. So uh, we're seeing a, a lag in registrations for that, but it's quickly catching up here. For the synchronous instruction, we uh, the training resources subgroup created a, a survey. It's just uh, about 15 questions long, takes just a couple minutes to answer, that is going to help people self-select which type of training they should get, first of all. And if at the end of that survey, they end up with a spark or ignite, they're recommended to participate in the synchronous instruction uh, um, remote trainings. If they score in the blaze or bonfire, they're recommended to participate in the asynchronous and, and scaled webinars. For individuals who are in the Spark or Ignite, they're given the option when they're registering for those synchronous remotes to choose uh, the pace. So a Spark training runs a little bit slower. We are anticipating more questions from our faculty members, maybe some more challenges with A, getting into Zoom or getting into Brightspace, following along. And so the pace is very, very slow. Um, they're more likely to be in the room with other individuals that work at that pace. So there seems to be less frustration overall. You don't have somebody who's working at a blaze pace in a spark training. We've all been there. It's horrifying and everybody gets frustrated. Uh, so these uh, differentiated instruction have, have worked really well. And I can tell uh, with Ignite trainings, we're generally done 45 minutes early. Sparks take you right to the end of that training. So there is a difference in those. Uh, we're, what we're seeing with that self-assessment is about 60% of our users are identifying either as Ignite or Spark, and fortunately, um, more in Ignite, which means that uh, the training can go at a little a faster pace there. And we do have very few in Bonfire. I, I don't even identify as Bonfire. I identify as Blaze. Uh, so this is really great. This is allowing us to do those scaled webinars. And we're seeing actually people who are participating in the synchronous remote continuing to attend those scaled webinars just to reinforce those concepts. We can see here numbers for our synchronous remote registrations. So um, we've trained 123 instructional designers from cohort one. Those numbers will be far fewer for cohorts two, three, and four. Uh, so there was a huge uh, audience for our instructional designers. That was uh, ESC made up a significant number of those because they have a huge uh, instructional design department there. Uh, but these are our numbers for our Spark, and you can see the numbers, the 252 versus 151 uh, reflected um, based on that pie chart that I just demonstrated. So following up with those kind of synchronous sessions, the scaled webinars and the uh, synchronous remote training, we have these asynchronous modules that were developed um, based on the learning objectives set by the training resources group and was were developed by myself and Robert Becker, who we brought on as an instructional design and trainer at the CPD to assist us with this DLA, DLE implementation. So he built these. Um, you can see that we have about 2,000 that are currently enrolled. It is 2,000 today, by the way, because um, more accounts are 
uh, created on a daily basis within Brightspace and then they get added in. And we have about 200 users who've actually earned the certificate, which means they've taken all nine quizzes and gotten 100%. We've also hidden some Easter eggs within the, the content. Uh, so uh, Brightspace has these options for awards. And so um, they we, we don't tell people what they are, just all of a sudden they'll get an award and, and people have been kind of excited about that. It's kind of exciting. So. Um, in addition to faculty and staff, we didn't want to leave our students behind. Uh, we know that they're going to be entering into a brand new learning environment. And in some, in some cases with the pilot, they're going to be in Brightspace and Blackboard or Brightspace and Moodle, et cetera. So we wanted to create some asynchronous modules that will be quick and easy for them to go through prior to starting their online courses in Brightspace. And uh, again, the training resources group came together and developed these um, uh, learning objectives for this. And we are building the modules for release in two weeks to campuses based on those learning objectives. And we're really gonna focus on communication tools, uh, setting up notifications and forwarding emails and setting up um, or understanding how to submit their work within Brightspace and see their feedback. There's also going to be a segment because the Pulse app is available, it's a Brightspace app. So we have a section on that as well. So if you're gonna be navigating your course from your computer, it's one thing. If you're navigating your course from the Pulse app, it's another. So we are taking them through the, that as well. Um, this is going to be packaged up and shared with cohort one campuses for them to have on their own uh, campus. So if they wanna add something specific to their campus, they can do. As soon as the lore comes, active within Brightspace, the learning object repository, we're actually going to put these student and faculty asynchronous modules in the learning object repository. The campuses can pull the information that they would like and host it on their own site that way. So I think that uh, brings me just here to the schedule. I have uh, my cohort one synchronous and remote training started on the 21st. The instructional designers training started on the 14th of March. And um, cohorts one through four, although that is a you know an asterisk there, anybody who has an account within Brightspace got access on the 14th to that. The synchronous remote pilot faculty for cohort two is going to begin on 429. And uh, student asynchronous modules go live on May 9th. Cohort two full faculty get access to registration for synchronous remote on the 1st and cohort three and four, we're gonna announce uh, future dates in August for everything there. Once we get past May and August of this year, we are going to be over the, the major hurdle, which is cohort one uh, training. And then we're gonna be able to probably just launch training for everybody at that point. But up until the end of August, we're really gonna be uh, under, the, under uh, fire for that. It's, we're just, uh, it's a tsunami of training. So um, I think that brings me to the end here. Oh, no, sorry. We are continuing with our fireside chats, but these fireside chats were weekly for a while. We can't sustain that right now. So we are um, pushing it out to every other week. We're going to see how attendance continues over the summer. We might hold off on any fireside chat chats in July and resume again in August. And that's it for me today. I am going to stop my share and um, I'm going to check the chat here. Jamie has a question about core two. Okay, great. Oh, oh, great, Jamie. What's your question? Uh, Jamie, you're muted if you're asking the question. While we wait for for Jamie, maybe she stepped away for a second. Um, Jamie Heron, is it are the the recordings? I mean, I see them in our as unlisted and. Where are they going to live? So um, they are now posted on, I'll, I'll, I'll share the link here, on the DLE website for the scaled webinars, by the way. Um, they're listed on the website, but it's behind authentication. And the reason I did it behind authentication is sometimes we talk about um, other LMSs and we don't want that out in the public sphere. So we have put it on this page and right now we have five by the end of probably Thursday, we'll have all seven webinars up here. Um, 
and, and people can access them that way. And we'll just have one version of each. Uh, there's no need for us to continue posting the same video. Uh, we'll just uh, continue to add, if, if the one is better, et cetera, then the other will continue to update that. The, the ones that are up there initially, I had COVID during, and so there's lots of coughing and I sound terrible. So we might replace some of the ones that are up right now. Jamie, did you have a question? Technical difficulties still, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. Yes, May 11th. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. They should not. Um, we're going to, that's, I'm talking with Victoria today, actually, because we just got the kickoff information. And so we're going to do our best to, to get your training done before faculty. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's a prerequisite that they access the sandbox. Interesting. They're going to notice some differences between the, the live instance and the sandbox. Okay but things have carried over what they built in the sandbox. We actually built the asynchronous modules in the sandbox and brought it into our live instance and everything came over just fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that emotional edge <laughs> in these workshops, but. Yeah, it can be it can be overwhelming. You know, some faculty have you know five courses plus different versions for different semesters plus summer semesters, right? So it's a lot of work for them to contemplate doing. But I think that um, they can see how great this this system is. Yeah, and they see how easy it is to create content that looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, good. I like to say it doesn't look like. 2005 anymore. Oh, <laughs> and I, I have, 2010, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I've really pushed the document templates. And when people see what those document templates look like, they're like, whoa, and it's so easy to use. Yeah, good. I will say that in, we get our occasion, occasional curmudgeons in the chat. We're like, why uh, Blackboard or Moodle was so great? Why are we switching? And, but mostly we get positive comments in those, those sessions. It helps that um, all of the trainers are really sold on Brightspace. We see the benefits for the students. And I think when we show it from the student perspective in the trainings, they get excited too. Uh, they can see the calendar and they can see how easy it is to participate and submit work. And when faculty see how easy it is to grade, oh my gosh, it's so easy to grade. <laughs> it's so easy to grade. It's going to save so much time. One of the things I've been doing, because I'm having a really hard sell going from Canvas to Brightspace is um, the instructional designers and I are keeping a list that we actually call things we love about Brightspace. Okay, good. Um, and we started with a handful. Um, we're up over a dozen. There are a couple things we hate. Me too. Um, course builder is very different from canvases. And of course, we're used to canvases. So okay. a lot of I it love the course builder. See, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a downgrade for us, but, oh, okay. but it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And in a few years, I mean, that's one of the things I love about higher ed, especially with students is after a few years, they won't have any institutional memory of what Canvas looked like. So that's true. It'll be, I'll outlast them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Laura, it is, it is really hard, but the, the list, um, it's funny, um, there are some things that you wouldn't expect, um, but, the, but there are just some things that, about Brightspace that are great. Yeah, <laughs> moving from Blackboard's easy. <laughs> yes, it is, Jamie, I agree. That's why I can sell it. <laughs> I'm in so a, I'm in a grad program at SUNY Poly. And every time I look at the cohorts, I'm like, why is SUNY Poly last? I'm yeah. so dying. <laughs> to take a course in Brightspace instead of Blackboard. Yeah. 
Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? If not, I have another meeting they have to jump to and I've been going since 8 a.m. So I yeah. wouldn't mind getting a refresh on my tea. Let's see the doodle meeting. I just wanted to say, Jamie, you could hop off if you need, yeah, need to, um, but um, there's going to be a fact two uh, task group next year proposed leveraging uh, Brightspace and sort of trying to learn from the transition about, you know, um, teaching and learning in an LMS uh, and what, you know, so we haven't, that task group has not been established yet. It'll probably be uh, voted on and talked about at the summer fact two uh, advisory group meeting. And so um, if you have thoughts about that, I'd be, I'd love to hear them. Um, you know, there's some ideas have been bounced around, but I think, you know, we should really, the fact that all of SUNY is moving, I mean, we haven't, I mean, yes, a lot of SUNY moved with Blackboard, uh, but not all of SUNY. So I think we really have an opportunity here to uh, learn uh, from this experience. And so uh, if you have any thoughts about how we might best do that, let me know. Anybody else? All right, yeah, my calendar told me there's a doodle meeting at, at, there is. at 11, so I know, see, Lori, that's probably, Jamie was headed. Anyway, yep. great to see you all. Thank Thanks you, Chris, nice to see meetings. you. meetings, and uh, hope to see some of Bye. you at CIT, and if not, uh, have a great summer, and you know, hopefully we'll see you in the fall. Awesome, Bye. All right, take care, everybody.